welcome us to um, this meeting of the Affordable Housing Trust um, intended to have been con conveyed as a subcommittee meeting for the affordable, uh, the ADU pilot project um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and Governor Healy's March 29, 2023 revised order extending remote participation by all members in any meeting of a public body. This meeting of the Great Barrington Affordable Housing Trust will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website, townofgb.org. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to listen to the meeting may do so in the following manner by um, following the link at the top of the agenda or the dial in only number. In no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technolo technological means. All votes will be roll call. Welcome to our meeting. Um, the first item on the agenda are changes that the trust made to the pilot project. None were made at the last right. meeting. And that brings us to the second item on the agenda, the scoring rubric for the applicant selection. I will share my screen. Um, so in an effort to give us a starting place, um, I put um, placeholder or what the either end of the spectrum could look like for the, th I think there's three, there's a project viability we have to set rankings for, um, location we have to set rankings for, though we know what we're ranking. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to conclude our discussion and resolve how we're going to think about and then rank impact. So shall we start at the top, project viability? So I am proposing that we would say the weakest would be a low level of detail on budget and the financial plan that prevent, um, such that it prevents assessment of viability. Yep, good. And that on the strongest end would be a detailed budget and financial plan that shows 100% of the project costs will be covered once the grant amount is included. Yes. You know, interestingly, I think a lot of this could also be used for our RFP criteria. I mean, I did cross my mind that we have like the RFP is much broader. <laughs> Yes. And when we talk about impact later and your point, um, Joe, about um, like ease of access to like spreading enough grants around, I, the way the RFP is structured makes them another option for an applicant. True. So, I mean, not for this meeting's topic, but um, I'm hoping that we'll continue to talk about the RFP mm -hmm. um, and maybe make revisions based on our work in this committee for the next fiscal year. Yeah. So then I think like other places we've done like then somewhat weak would maybe mirror something where um, there's some detail, you know, but it's not enough. And then moderate would be you have some, you have some, you have moderate level of detail on both the budget and the financial plan. And then somewhat strong would be like you have strong detail on either the budget or the financial plan, but not both. Mm -hmm. Something like that. That sounds good to me.
something is that yeah i think that's probably fine i mean it's you know pretty subjective any any no matter what we do so yeah but that basically meets yes yeah. i think so okay and I don't, there's no in between on the next one. You're either in oh, or you're not. One, and Joe, you proposed that this gets set up in the actual application as just a in out criteria and nothing else matters after that. And I agree with that. Yeah. Um, okay, location. We defined location um, that we would consider ease of access to groceries or food and Main Street. I didn't put that in here. And then also cell service coverage. Oh no. Hey. What's oh, never mind. I thought well, I gotta find out, but I didn't because you're the co-host. I think you're actually hosting now, Amanda. Okay. I I think that, that you when I hosted last week, you still got the recording, and so that's good. Yes, the recording's still going. Okay. Um, so then location, weakest would be must, it must have transportation to access grocery or food and Main Street. There's no cell service coverage. The strongest would be walking distance of grocery food and Main Street, and there's also full cell coverage. Right. So then I would propose we kind of do the same thing, like weakest is you have some, but like like only if you have one of all of those. Right. Right. Is you have a mix, and then um, somewhat two strong out. is right. Two out of three. Most. Okay. So something like that. Yeah. We're going to be done really early. Well, that's okay too. It is okay. Um, okay. Resident landlord financial needs. So this is the extent to which the landlord applicant meets and demonstrates financial strain meeting cost of living in Great Barrington that an income restricted ADU would help alleviate. So I'm proposing that weakest would be there is no financial need, at least that we can see in the application or right. that reviewers can see in the application. Mm -hmm. And the strongest would be a person demonstrates that the rental income will prevent the homeowner or landlord from leaving their home. Yes. Um, I don't have a I don't have an easy way to chunk out the three middle ones. I'm open to suggestions. Yeah. You know, this is almost like great Barrington resident. Do you have financial aid or not? Um, well, I do think that like I do think there's a real range of what kind of financial need somebody would demonstrate. And so I, I do actually think having a spectrum is helpful. It's just oh, some benchmarks for it. Yeah. Um, if we could figure out the middle one, we could probably do the other two. Mm -hmm. No financial need. Um, Maybe something like... Um like off, offsets uh, housing costs of um, like <clears throat> something about the 30, the magic 30% of income. Um, oh, oh, interesting. So like it would um, brings. Yeah, bring brings residents. Costs. Brings residents household costs under 30% of income. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I 
I'm just trying to figure out the actual words. Um, um it's basically it's, it's basically like a uh, rental from ADU. The rental from the ADU would bring their It's not rental income from ADO brings um here it really brings landlord homeowner expenses. Yeah. Expenses um, uh to thirty percent to around thirty percent for housing costs. And then like um if you want to do it that way, then you can you can talk about somebody who like even with the offset of, of of affordable rental, it'll still bring them, they'll still have, like if someone has a fixed income. Yeah. Then it's like. Oh, sorry, finish what you're saying, Joe. It's just like, you would be somebody who like, who's still struggling even with the help. I don't know, is this, that's, I'm not sure if that's, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not actually, my thought's not like fully coherent. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure how this this works exactly. Um, so um, you hope you hope that this person who's 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 gonna be um who's gonna have to leave their house, you would hope that, that we could bring their costs down to 30% of household income. So maybe we want maybe we want to talk about their current costs, not yeah. Why don't we talk about their let's not talk about the rental income, let's talk about yeah, let's just let's just talk about somebody who so no financial need, somebody, so the second, no financial need, second one is uh, somebody whose costs are less than, whose housing costs are right. less, are less than 30%. That's, they, they need less help. Oh, if, they're, right. if their housing costs are less than 30%, they need less help. If their housing costs are, are at or around 30%, and then if their housing costs are more than 30%, yeah. like substantially more could be, you could say, than 30%, then they need help. And then if they're gonna get kicked out, they really need help. Yeah. I actually um, like that. I was thinking qualitative, but I think that quantifies it in a really yeah, a I good agree. way to. Uh, Jeremy? Make it easier. Um. So, I mean, the only thing with this, I think the trouble that you run into sometimes with the 30%, because it's usually of income. And when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about uh, uh, like unit owners, usually they, they may not have um, like visible income, but they may have substantial assets. And so I think you want to be careful um to just link it just solely to um you know 30 percent of uh like housing costs 30 percent of income yeah. so what would like um if it was like housing costs are less than 30 percent of their household income and well, i mean i think it's good and we like added yeah. and they show little they show no financial need like what if we add a slight, a broader catch-all just about general financial need that would speak to somebody, you know, would speak to a situation where there's a strong asset profile. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I, I just have heard like grumblings before on, on like not this in particular, but um, in um, looking at need where need is evaluated by income. And yeah. the person has very little income, but then substantial um, uh, assets. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, I mean, I think it's all going to be in, you know, um, yeah. like who's, who's evaluating the application and is there enough in it that you can um that you can deny an application um uh when you don't think there's need you yeah. know 
and that you're not going to get someone's not going to turn around and go after you for it i mean i i think that's the only thing so what if we did like if you see well you can't see jeremy because i think you were on a phone maybe. yeah <laughs> well i can i just have to get really close well, i can also read it out loud so i'm proposing that um the weakest is still no financial need just period then somewhat says housing costs are less 30 less than 30 percent of the household income and there is little financial need footnote financial need should include an assessment of assets and then it moderate is housing costs are at 30 percent of household income and there is some financial need um somewhat strong as housing costs are over 30 percent and there is clear financial need yeah I think it's okay. It, and then you, when you say are at three percent, you want to say something like are are near or something like that, or around. When you when the um the housing needs so study, it, has, it can only be moderate if it's exact down to the penny. <laughs> so we have like a substantial part of the Great Barrington population um, now whose housing costs um, are over thirty yeah. percent. So it's. So the thirty percent thing is is kind of a low bar in Great Barrington already. <laughs> yeah, because okay, like that's kind of yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of the point. There's a lot of need already. <laughs> All right, but I, but I think when you bring in the asset thing, I think that it, it helps. Yeah, yeah. So to make sure you're getting someone. <laughs> we're doing great, team. Yes. All right, that brings us to six cost effectiveness. Um, we'd ended on this, and then uh, Fred, you had added a comment when we moved on to comments that you that I wanted to make sure we could revisit. Could you share what your concerns are about the limitations of estimating of looking at use in relation to square footage? I don't know what you're talking about. Ah, so the category is cost effectiveness. I, I can see, yeah. Yeah, and what we're evaluating is the extent to which the project cost is effective. And the measurement we were proposing was um, the weakest would make the poorest use of the estimated cost per square foot. And the strongest would be would make the best use of the estimated cost per square foot. Um, I, I I vaguely recall something, and basically, there's a wide range between building something new or renovating something existing. Whether you have a space and you just want to fit it out, um, the square foot cost is very, very different. I think the word that I was using was efficiency of... Um, of the resources, you know, the dollar resources, making efficient use of the dollar resources. Um, um so I, I don't know how to I don't know how to phrase that. I mean yeah, let me ask to, back a question to see if I can see if I'm following you. Um so is it that you're saying if we use this as the benchmark, automatically a renovation would have a, a stronger score. Yes. And so can you walk me through what would be the downside of that? Well, this is simply an inequity between renovating an existing space or creating a new one. Um, but we okay. could take that into account when we look at it, couldn't we? Well, I mean, I before we even go there, Bill, my question would be in thinking again that we're we are ranking multiple different aspects. Yeah, is it a problem for us that the highest cost efficiency would always be a re renovation? Like it wouldn't take somebody out of the running. And it makes me think about like, Joe, your overall goal to be like, the end goal needs to be as many units as possible. So this potentially is a place where um, 
efficient use of existing structures gets rewarded in the scoring. Mm -hmm. And that also might mean there, that the pot can go further. Yes. I think that's a legitimate argument to be made that we can construct this rubric so that it covers more, that it tends to cover more uh, units. And number six is the place to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're saying, um, they're talking about the cost of the project overall. They're talking about the, the combination of, of the um, basically grant money, uh, the grant money uh, plus whatever out of pocket the homeowner has. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it wouldn't make a difference, right? It's just the project cost. So let's say that, um, let's say there's a proposal to take a former duplex that's been used as a single family home. And um, it's, it's going to add a lot of square footage as an ADU by just restoring it to the duplex that it previously was. And it's probably also going to be fairly low cost. That would rank very high on this application. Right. So and where does leverage come in? You know, in terms of if we grant X number of dollars and the project is, say we granted 25,000, the project's only 100,000. Yeah. You know, is that a better use of our money than granting 25,000 for a $200,000 project? They want to do that with the with the next criterion with with number seven. So, yeah. so the so six that the way I understand it, it's it's basically like looking out. It's really looking out for the homeowner, saying, like we're gonna we're gonna favor the projects, like we're gonna favor the projects that just are most that are mo that you make the most efficient use of money in the universe. Yeah. Um. Which I think kind of makes sense in terms of like, if there's two people in the point, like we're trying, we're trying to help people not, ideally people don't take on a, a bunch of debt to do this. Um, it's almost like, though, it's almost like, it's almost like I, I would want it to be more like, I, I think this I, the way, if you put it in this, in like this, it will have an effect if it's, if it ha is, goes into the ranking or go, goes into the, the rubric of encouraging people to to be frugal uh and so that's good for the goals of the project because we're not trying to load people up with that um but it's all but like another way to approach it would be like some sort of like it's it's it it has some aspects of the first criterion about like a like a business plan basically like making sure that they're clear on their on their roi i mean it's it it's interesting, right? Because this is the place where um, it asks for good design solutions. So it's, you know, it's kind of um, in conversation with, I think, number one, the financial plan and project, like financial plan project viability and um, location. I mean, not location, but um, living space proposed, right? So it mm -hmm. it balances those out, right? That um, the trust is going to reward um, efficiency design. Yeah, designs that aren't overblown, aren't overly elaborate, that um, are going to get the job done with a like with an elegant design that is also cost effective, yeah, and financially sound um uh in um is, Jeremy, is your hand up or is that just still still up from before your i don't i don't see it as up sorry that's okay i just i will lower your hand there you go um yeah. do you continue joe Oh, I was just gonna say at, at my work um at, in the mornings we have stand-ups and one of the things we do is um we'll talk about like 
parking lot and part we'll say that we'll take an issue to a park to the parking lot it's like like to say like there's something that we're going to talk about later but we're not going to talk about it in the main flow um anyways i was i was i was going to say i would like to parking lot discussion of uh tiny homes uh after we go through all this stuff because i think they're very they're they're very complex they're a little bit complicated in terms of assets and uh like cost effectiveness so i'm saying so i'm saying like let's talk about let's come back if we yeah. have time and talk about tiny houses but um but as for this i mean yeah i'm fine keeping Every this I'm sorry, my puppy just discovered how to steal my shoes from their hiding spot. So. <laughs> little, I've been there. Little, little rescue operation happening over here. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll put that in the parking lot. Um, our goal. I think you need a little work, little editing, on, you know, not the worst might be. <laughs> yeah. Hard to interpret yeah. once we're looking at something. These so are your proposals are good, but it's not the worst. That's okay, terrible. So Yes. Um, <laughs> we're hoping to end by 730. Um, and we actually need to because Bill has to leave. Um, okay. But yeah, so if we could put some words in besides not the worst, that'd be great. Um, so makes poorest use. Um, are we comfortable with like using the same sentence for average and fairly good? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um so you just yeah. need not the worst might need a, a better sentence. Somewhat better. Or... <laughs> I've been trying to avoid not to say somewhat because that's the overall header. Yeah. We can we can cop out on one. A little bit better use. Somewhat slightly better use. I still like the word efficient. Yeah. You could say it makes makes inefficient use and, and somewhat inefficient. Yeah, inefficiently. So I mean number one is almost like cost too much or is you know excessively expensive or something like that. Uh number two is you know improved efficiency of uh resources of no, cost but, per square foot you're like you're saying improve that um improve like then you still need a baseline so i think each category the the words in it need to describe the thing not ref ref reference the previous one if that makes sense okay yeah it does make sense mm -hmm. okay um um is it so this would be is i mean inefficient you know inefficiently is inefficient use of of estimated cost yeah i would get rid of the is oh thank you um I mean, the other part you can see is pays for many bells and whistles you don't need. I don't know. We can make this somewhat. That's fine with me. Sometimes you just have to stop being an English major. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Fairly efficient. Yeah, I don't think good's necessary. Moderately efficient. Moderately efficient is good. I mean, for the, the highest one, I would almost say is you know 
most effective, most. Yeah. Well, uh, it gets to compared to what it needs. So we want it to compare to itself. Yeah, yeah. I think most efficient would do it. Yes. You know, but, you know, well, it creates a great deal of space for, for the resources. I don't know, maximized. Most bang maximizes for the efficiency. There you go. How many Z's? Well, I don't know. All of them. All the Z's. Okay. That's good. Okay. That's good. Works. Um, so we can affirm that if you want. I mean, I, I actually can understand that. You know, I mean, I think mm -hmm. the yardstick has to be when we go to interpret this with a proposal, can we actually understand what we're trying to right. read? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Fred, before you, I think before you signed on, we were saying, that we might adopt this rubric uh, for the um, like use it use it to help with the RFC, the, just like the regular RFC. RFP. Or like, yeah, R R RFP, like aspects of the language. Okay, I mean the RFP has its own kind of standards in it that the proposers, yeah, have been given. And um, CDC has notified us that they are going to come in for the. Uh, yeah, that's true. We should limit our discussion because that is not on the agenda. Okay. Um. So here's the the last one. Um. So we were having robust discussion last time we met. Um. I heard at least three ideas in the discussion, and I tried to summarize them here in the yellow. So one was that impact is about the number of people impacted by a single project. Um, another idea, Jeremy, you were speaking to this, the idea that impact really has to do with the community. And then a third idea is that the impact is the number of ADUs that would be added by the pilot project. Yeah, I almost think that none of these are in opposition to, to each other. And yeah. that, you know, there must be some way to synthesize the at least the meaning, if not the actual lines. Yeah. I mean, I do like one thing I, I value this discussion and I want to work through this regardless of what I'm about to say. It did stand out to me that in the RFP that we just posted, um, our and what we're asking for and what we're expecting demonstrates far less rigor and far fewer restrictions. And that anybody who might want to apply for this project could just apply under that RFP. Um, the difference, so then it gets me thinking, and I find it helpful then to be like, so why do we need this? And the, the difference would be the specific purpose of building an access point for people who are struggling to be able to live here to access resources where they might get they might not have a strong an application in a purely open field which is what the R other rfp is as it currently stands mm -hmm. right if they could use the money to help stay in their home that puts yeah, so, in a separate category almost. So it does make me want to argue even stronger for the purpose of this pot is um, becomes really about impacting impacting the those two households that the impact on, on the financially insecure household is why we're carving out the separate money. Yeah. Now. Joe, I think it actually would be a good argument to say, and it is true that ADUs aren't aren't necessarily favored in the other RFPs either. So that it's specific to ADUs is also true. Mm -hmm. so but I think we can market these differently, and I think that they'll target different audiences. No, I agree with that. I'm just speaking like structurally, what do they do and why do we need both? And 
I would still argue that we need both, but I, you know, why I think given the way we structure the RFP, the idea that we would set a certain number of grants or an a, a amount for grants should be off the table because we didn't even, we it wasn't on the table at all for the other RFP. Mm. So why would we- uh, That doesn't follow. The other RFP does not say anything about, it just says there's a total, here's a total amount, there's a total amount of money annually and we will accept applications on a rolling basis until it's gone. Yeah. I think that that's what we should do here. Okay. Like Sorry. why? Yeah. This made me, yeah. I was taking a walk the other day and I was like, wait a minute, this is what happens all the time in policy that, um, you know, when we're talking about the little guy or the littler guy, we're talking about 0% interest loans. We're talking, we're, we're always like adding these extra hoops they have to jump through. But when we're talking about developers, mm. like we didn't, it didn't even occur to me to be like, oh, we should structure those as zero, you know, 0% loans, interest loans. Um, and we can return to all of that conversation, but it struck me that we were having a very restrictive conversation about a pot of money that's designed to help people who are financially struggling. And we didn't have that conversation. We were talking about developers and organizations. Yeah. So, I mean, well, So I think I, I think so. One of the things we with the RFC, I mean, we're, we're we're talking in terms of this. We're talking about the RFC in in in, in with respect to this thing. That's right. Um, at the last second in our or not the last second, but like late in the discussion of the RFC, we said like like this this can be organizations or individuals. That's right. right. So yeah. I think. I instead and that's like that sort of changes it the idea like well it could be an individual, um so the sort of double standard I think um or the sort of attitude is like well okay with a so it's like three like it's like three three different categories so one is a nonprofit organization so the idea is like when we transfer money to a nonprofit organization for them to create some value. Uh, we we assume that no individual person is, is getting like a private benefit because you know right. it's like, you know what I mean like like Habitat for Humanity no one's like lining their pockets like C CDC no one's lining their pockets right so that's like right. one category of like use of the public monies then there's this other category which has been coming up more which is a private corporation that will that that's going to create value for the community but they will also get a private benefit. Like, like somebody will at the end of the day get a bigger paycheck because they, because you know, they can offset yeah. some cost or whatever. And we've and we've been that is not unprecedented, though. I mean, like at town meeting, people don't aren't super into it, but it, like it happens. Like that's that's how CPA funds get spent. Sometimes they go to a to a private benefit. So then there's a third category of where it's not like a sole, it's not like you know, uh, a LLC, but it's actually like a person and like, they're just like getting the check. And there's a kind of like, I think if you sort of ask people like, like in a way people will be, some people will be more offended by the idea of like Bob getting the money than CDC getting the money. You know what I mean? Like that, we just need to be, be careful about it. Cause it's like, cause then they, the way we would answer is say like, no, 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 it's still public benefit because one benefit is like Bob was going to have to leave the community. Another benefit is that Bob is renting to somebody. So there's two these two benefits, and it's the same as what we were talking about with with the, when we were we were going to give the money to the private developer. It's the same thing. That's that that would be our defense. And, and the other thing I would say to my fellow taxpayers is, for any like any of us, except those of us on the Affordable Housing Trust, any of us who, um would like to do something like this and think we would have a strong application for this program or can apply and access it, right. one. And two, if somebody thinks 
what I want to do isn't quite this. We are currently providing another vehicle that any Great Barrington taxpayer can access through the RFP. And right. yes, that might get refined, you know, in the next fiscal year, but, um, you know, part, you know, I think the public benefit is multifold. It's the, it is the housing, it's getting, it's being able to help your neighbor and it's also being able to be helped by funds that you were part of providing. Right. You know, because between these two programs, a lot of people are eligible if that's something they want to do. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to float again. Um, the idea that minimum impact could be defined as a studio unit and one resident of the landlord's, and there's one resident in the landlord's residential unit. Mm -hmm. And that maximum impact would be a multi-room ADU and the highest number of residents in the landlord's residential unit. And that we could model the somewhat moderate, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, yes. on, on the other um, multi-factor measures where, you know, it's one but not the other, then it's a little bit of both, and then it's um, a really strong of one, but not the other. Mm -hmm. So we care about the number of residents in the landlord's residential unit? Well, because it's that many people who would then be um, made financially stable. So it in like that's a way to measure impact that um, if, the if the income from the ADU is stabilizing a family of seven, that's different than if it's stabilizing one person. Yes. And all of the people, the one a one person is also worthy of being stabilized. And that will, you know, that will come out in the financial need category. So yeah. Okay. So it's it, it, I'm sorry, Joe. It, it appears redundant because it does come out in the financial need category. No, we you know, I think that if you do this, it. you're always going to bias it towards lar a, a large landlord residential unit versus uh, one elderly person in need. Well, no, because you could have you could have the a one person, a single house, a single person household with the highest level of need, the strongest ranking there, and um they and a, a lower ranking here and that's okay they you know it's all gonna it's gonna be the combined picture right um and maybe the maybe the single household person with the highest level of need um but maybe what they're able to do is make a multi-room unit available and so then um then they might get a a um, moderately moderate or um whatever the next category is somewhat strong yeah are, are all the categories going to have the same weight essentially i mean i think that our job is to get this far and at some point we just have to hand it off yeah so you know I think it would, I, when I've had to score things using systems like this, you know, it's just like I mark each one, I give it the ranking I think it has. And then you mm -hmm. look at, you look at it compared to other applications or you, yeah. the overall picture. And it's the only way to do it, really. Yeah. Jeremy you know, has a... that, like, aside from um, the binary, like, you have to be a great Barrington resident. <laughs> You know, I think the only other way that you definitely automatically kind of be like this program isn't for you is if an application everything ranked weak, probably that wouldn't pass would be my guess. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think Jeremy, Jeremy has his hand back up again. Um, the only thing with this criteria is um, the multi 
room with ADUs, you're um, limited by um, like usable square feet, uh, square feet. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how many rooms you can get. And so it's like net usable. So you can minus out the walls and things. Yeah. Um, but it's only 900 square feet. So I don't know if you if you want to talk about maybe changing this to just be unit, like adding a unit. Um, so well, we, like, I think we want to be able to differentiate between a studio and a one bedroom. Yeah, but if you're talking about a two bedroom, are you really going to be able to get one, you know? And so like, a like if you're, if you're looking for like maximum number of people, I mean, you can change this proposal by like not limiting it to just adding an ADU. Right. So if you're talking an existing structure and it was a duplex, you know, like the duplex might, the original four, and might have been two units that were greater than 900 square like uh, or net square feet and you I know so that, that um i thought that chris said 12 uh is it I've, let me see yeah i thought that chris because i asked about that like if we go with the language of adu yeah and somebody wanted to restore a duplex would they be eligible under that and i thought that chris affirmed that yeah you can but it, you're still under like if you're calling it an ADU, you're still stuck under the square footage. Um, yeah. Like so, an, an ADU in an existing structure, you can do that, but you're still limited by square feet or uh, usable square feet. So it's not like the, you know. Um, so let me ask a clarifying question. So if there was a house that had previously been a duplex mm -hmm. and it was over the square footage what would happen if somebody wants to restore that to a duplex? I mean, you can do it. You just have to like change the layout around to make that second unit, the unit you're calling an ADU smaller, right? But mm. the thing that you can do in Great Barrington, right, is you have three units on a on a um on a lot by right, as long as you can, you know with within the setbacks and all of that kind of setbacks and lot coverage and all that kind of thing. And so um so what what it really means it's like a duplex plus an ADU. Um so uh, like if the goal is to increase housing meaning increase the number of units um you know if you're going from a single family or a single unit property to a two unit property you're still satisfying that but the second unit wouldn't have to be an adu meaning it wouldn't have to be 900 usable square feet or less but 900 square feet i mean you know if you're talking a bedroom is 12 by 12 or 12 by 14 at 168 square feet um mm -hmm. a kitchen similar size Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a one bedroom. It is big. You're right. A one a one bedroom is under six hundred square feet. Mm -hmm. If you're talking net usable, I mean, with, with a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it could be a couple as opposed to a single. Uh, or. Yeah, I mean, I'm in sixteen hundred square feet. I have three bedrooms, two and a half baths, mm -hmm. and like I could easily have. A fourth bedroom but that i mean that's and it's not net right so i mean maybe you could squeeze that in it um uh, i mean i think like yeah i mean i guess it's possible in 900 square feet you could have two bedrooms you know you're it, you're gonna have a hard time fitting seven hundred seven people in nine hundred square feet. Though. Yeah, that's no, not no, hard. No. Seven, <laughs> that's seven super people. ambitious. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, sorry, Jeremy. That refers to it's it's not yeah. the number of people who fit in the ADU that we're ranking. Oh, it's the number of people in on yeah. the property. Although, I like see. a multi room AD, because you on the planning stage, all you know is what the design is. You don't know who's gonna rent. Yeah, yeah. 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 On the you know on the planning stage a two bedroom 
might mean that it's a parent and a child or a couple and a child, but it also mm -hmm. could just be that it's a layout that has a private bedroom, maybe a small room that can be used for an office, an actual living room. Like, mm -hmm. And so that would be, you know, a, a couple could comfortably live in something like that, whereas a couple is less likely to comfortably live in a studio, but it's all just a likelihood at the design phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, so I, I just don't, I, I really, I don't like the, like this, this, um, I just don't, I just don't like the, the sort of change in direction with this one. And it, to me, it seems like the sort of slipperiest criteria, um, where it, like where where it's like going from like the size of the unit and stuff like that um of those criteria i feel like if you said something like uh lowest is um uh lowest is uh I guess I guess the highest is is maximizes the number of ADUs in the project, and the but the way you would have to evaluate that is do them all at once, and then get that number. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not it's ranking the project. It's not ranking a project. Like, it's not ranking the application in front of me. Because right. you're talking about ADUs given the First funds. Thing, yeah, you're going right? back to if we have $150,000, we want to fund the most projects possible with that. And right. that's and that's where I, my pushback on that is like we didn't have that discussion at all about the RFP we just released. So, so why so would we hamstring so this project that way? So like in any discussion that we have about like uh, for money, for that that pool of money, like I would certainly be the voice of, is this the most efficient use of our money? Yeah. Like to me, the bar right now is that we have on, I guess on one or two occasions, we've given organizations $100,000 in each case for one affordable unit. So we, like we did that on not the marble block with the other one. Sumner. Sumner. We did that we did that on Sumner, one hundred thousand. I feel like we did it. We've done it on some other ones. Right? Yeah, but if you put that on this rubric to, uh, you know, there's actually six apartments there that they promised will all be affordable. Only one or two of them are going to be deeded affordable, yeah. but we're giving it to CDC who has told us that they intend to keep all of those, you know, the, the, the purpose of the whole project is to keep the, all of those affordable. I know, but like in each case, we would like, we'd like give them a hundred thousand and they'd be like, with this 100,000, we're going to hold one for you. And then they'd go and get, and they'd get more money from someone else. And like with this 100,000, you know, like that's the math yeah. seems to work out to a hundred thousand. And the private developer who came before CPA last year wanted two hundred and fifty thousand for one unit. He wanted two hundred fifty for a limited for a limited number of years. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is that like, like, if even if it's not explicitly mentioned in that in that R in that RFC uh, requirement, like if somebody comes and says I can add one affordable unit for two hundred thousand dollars, I'll say it's too expensive, right? Like, like that, I would certainly be the voice for that. Yeah, and I think the RFP has that kind of language that will allow you to make that assessment and finding. Can we bring that into this? As I'm, as Hernandez pointed out, this is much more rigorous. Yeah, this is mean, much more specific. And I, while I I value this, and I think it will. I think it will be something that we return to and draw from for other things, and that's part of the value. I just have to point out again, like, why are we bringing this level of rigor to a program that's designed to try to help people participate in solving the housing crisis who are already struggling? And we don't bring it when we're talking about 
developers and the and reason them. is we want to you this is an asset for us when we sit down as the judge if you will or the the reviewer who reviews the proposal and we have to make a decision on whether to fund a project or not we have to talk about what the goals are that we were trying to see every one of these uh rubrics should be related to the goal that we're trying to achieve yeah this is this is for us more than it's for the developer or for the owner mm -hmm. you know this is for us to make a, a reasoned judgment on a proposal so yeah. joe compromise would you what about if we said that the and they you know you'll see this on RFPs all the time. What if we said there's this there's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars available and a minimum of two grants will be made. Um. And then that still leaves the leeway for people to put the proposal they need to put in for the financial picture they have. It means that we're still gonna use a very rigorous rubric to evaluate it. Um, and it's not uncommon that when you do that, you actually end up you end up funding. Like, so it takes off the table applications for 150,000. And so it means the applications you get will be for, they'll they will be thinking about how to put together a tighter financial picture mm -hmm. and that it will increase the likelihood that three, you know, three or more actually can be approved. Yes. So can you say it again? So you said that we'll have at least two. Yeah. So usually what the, like when I am applying for something at work, um, you know, what I'll see is, there's a total pot of, in this case, 150,000 available for this pilot program. A minimum of two projects will be funded. Yeah, that's fine. Now you're and you're saying that like there might be a situation where somebody wants 100,000, another person wants 50,000. Yep. Or, but it it changes how people approach. That's fine. What, yeah, what they're putting, how they're putting their budget together. And so it increases the likelihood that you'll have um, you'll have multiple projects that can be funded from the same pot. Okay, so so for this for this like pilot phase, we would say there'll be at least two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So based on that, um, I would I would just not worry about the other thing. You the, take out the impact. Completely. I would take out impact. I feel like. Like it, like there's, there might be something there about like, like, you know, you would vaguely prefer if it can help. Like, I kind of like the thing about like number of people, but I don't think we want to get too nitty gritty about like, like three bedrooms is better than two because yeah, because we don't want to like, we don't, you don't want to encourage someone to try to put like three bedrooms in a 900 square foot unit. Right. 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 You don't want, you're, 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 like our message is not like cram people in, like that's not what we're trying to do. Right. Um, so if it was like moderate, like let's just run through this one time if, and then we can decide to take it off the table, that's fine. So minimum would be a studio and there's only one resident in the landlord's residence. Some uh, less week or whatever the category would be, a studio, it's a still a studio unit. Um, it's either a studio unit or it's one resident in the landlord's unit. Um, Moderate would be you get to, there's at least one bedroom and there's more than one resident in the landlord's residential unit. Um, somewhat strong would be there, it's a multi-room ADU or it has a high number of residents in the landlord's unit. And then the maximum is it is both multi-room, which again, like can just be as simple as there's like actually a kitchen, right? Like I'm not, I'm not actually, I don't think we should say it's two bedroom or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I think so, that's I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't bother. Okay. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure you need this whole line, you know, the whole thing. I think it's captured elsewhere. 
Um, no. I'm going to make a motion that we yeah. adopt this rubric and recommend it as part of the ADU pilot for vote by the oh, Affordable House Trust. I will second that. Um, roll call vote, uh, Jeremy. Well, I definitely am not voting on this because I'm not a member of the trust. <laughs> right. Oh, that's right. That the trust. Well, um, without recording, it, we'll come back to that. Um, Bill. Yes. Fred. Yes. Joe. Aye. Ananda. Yes. And then Jeremy, were this a subcommittee meeting as it was intended, your vote would be? Um, yes. All right. I feel like we've covered all the bases. Okay. I got to go. All right. Thank you. See you all Is, later. Um, before we adjourn, um, member speak time. Um, um, Bill, you could go if you need to. I think that's I'll okay. I'll see you. I got to leave my machine up because I think it's linked in somehow. I can't actually leave. <laughs> okay. the so. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs> Member speak. I'm okay. Fine. Citizen um media speak time. No no media. And there's Vivian if she wants to speak. Vivian, is there anything you'd like to say? Okay. Um I move to adjourn the meeting. I seconded. Second. Aye. 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 May your nights be lovely. Bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody.